Hi, I'm Dr. Kavita Bapat from India. Today's topic is the surgeries of fall prolapse. I'm a hardcore vaginal surgeon and I do maximum surgeries, minimal invasive vaginal surgeries to vaginal root. And all the glorious journey begins with a bright vision. That's my thing. And I'm really proud to tell you that I, Kavita Bapat, come from a place called Indore and it is the seven times nominated for the cleanest city of India and really I'm proud for that. And once again, I thanks, thank you so much for giving me chance to today speak on the subject of choice today. So the wall prolapse, basically, the introduction is vaginal prolapse is basically a disabling condition to the women and symptoms something coming down, feeling pressure in the vagina is always a common complaint. We have that patients who have lot many urinary complaints such as poor stream, hesitancy, straining to void, incomplete emptying, recurrent urinary tract infection, and to need to reduce the bulk digitally to void, the defecate may also present specially when associated with anterior and posterior compartment this thing. So uterine and vaginal wall prolapse is a very, very important thing. And may, this is like this, all this, everything, the anterior vaginal wall, the posterior vaginal wall, everything collapses and goes down. And especially the wall prolapse, post hysterectomy, the chances of having wall prolapse is uh, there. Um, the important point, the vaginal wall prolapse has been defined by the International Continents Society as a descent of the vaginal cuff below the point that is two centimeter less than the total vaginal length above the plane of hymen. Number two, it occurs when the upper vagina bulges into or outside the vagina and the prolapse does not have negative impact on these women's quality of life due to associated urinary, anorectal as well as a coital dysfunction. So how we will say that how we will evaluate the description of the wall prolapse is basically most vaginal cup prolapse include the apical androceal where the pubocervical fascia and the rectovaginal fascia are separated. Number two, the peritoneum becomes stretched and comes in direct contact with the vaginal epithelium creating a true hernia. Then the vaginal epithelium is stretched and becomes very smooth without rubies. And fourth point is there is always some degree of high cystocele formation and associated with the vaginal wall prolapse. So this is an evaluation and description of the these things. And pelvic organ, similar with the pelvic organ prolapse, this is a pop Q is an objective and a standardized system for the prolapse classification. The, for the wall prolapse also, it has a, also a useful tool in assessing the extent of prolapse. It has got the added advantage for the evaluation for the surgical and non-surgical treatment and what will be the outcome for the clinical research purposes. So the clinical application of 3D MRI is unclear, though there are studies and they say there's a poor correlation between the MRI and a clinical assessment, especially the when the vaginal apical prolapse. We should know a little anatomic background before talking about the surgeries of the wall prolapse. Clinically, detachment of the cardinal uterosacral ligament complex from pericervical ring occurs at the level of ischial spine and provides the anatomic rationale for the development of the uterine descent, post-hysterectomy, vaginal wall prolapse, and enterocyte. So you can uh, justify once the uterus being removed, all the uterosacrals, all the fascia, everything, they at the level of ischial spine, there is a lossing and there is an anatomic rationale. So it develops this thing. So how we will classify the wall prolapse? So the first degree when the vaginal apex is visible, when perineum is depressed, number one. Second degree apex extends just through the introitus. Third degree vaginal wall prolapse is upper two third of the vagina is outside the introitus. And entire vagina is outside the introitus is a degree four. Now for the description and evaluation of the wall prolapse, this is a how to examine the patient. This is being done and how we'll do the surgeries, how to plan it. See, you can see the wall prolapse is at fourth degree. Everything out, the anterior vagina, posterior vagina, and the both, all things are there. So non-surgical management is a conservative management, which is basically most useless. And I don't think it should be done and it should be good for thing. It includes the pelvic floor exercises. 
pelvic floor exercises has got a very, I think, 0% rather uh, role for this. And the role of wall prolapse management is unclear. There is no evidence suggests the pelvic floor exercises are helpful. However, the paces have the limited role, but the when it's very frail and ancillary woman and surgery is not option, then this can be used. So the vaginal approach, the number one is a Meckel's caldoplasty. It should be done properly while doing the uh, previous cystectomy. Then sacrospinous ligament fixation, high uterocellular ligament suspension with facial reconstruction and then iliococcygeous facial suspension and mesh plastic. So these are the vaginal roots which we do the wall prolapse surgeries. So the surgical management, number one, is a vaginal approach. Aim of the surgery, number one, improve the quality of life. Number two, all aspects of the prolapse, pathology, patient's lifestyle, age, presence of comorbidities, and sexual function must be taken into consideration. Third important point is to surgeon to understand the patient's expectation. And fourth important point is discuss available options, including the drawbacks, so that the appropriate procedure with the potential fulfiller expectation can be achieved. So for the surgical uh, management, we talk about when we talk about the vaginal approach, patient with good pelvic floor muscle strength as assessed by clinical examination, and reasonably, there should be substantive endopelvic fascia. Number two, the vaginal approach using the native tissues may be appropriate. And vagina is anchored to the existing stable structures like a, we can anchor it with a sacrospinous ligament. We can do it with the iliococcygeous muscle and endopelvic fascia. And women with the attenuated fascia, poor pelvic floor, repeat and repair, severe ongoing physical stress are better served by the techniques of model suspension that provides a compensatory repair rather than the vaginal or abdominal approach using the mass. So it's an another important point. But before talking about that, how we can prevent the wall prolapse? So Meckel's caldoplasty is a very, very important. It described by Meckel in 1957. This technique is to correct entrocele to involve the suspension of the wall into the origin urotrosacral ligament and obliteration of the cul-de-sac. So the, both the uterocycles should come together through a small suture, running suture, so the androcele and obliteration of the cul-de-sacs. The original description involved the extensive excision of the vaginal epithelium, which often resulted into the dyspareunia. So the maximum vaginal epithelium should not be removed. But the recently the Elkins et al. described that the high McCall's caldoplasty and technique was described to repair the prolapsed vagina and the hysterectomy. After the uterine fundus being delivered, the entire colpotomy is incision given, the both the uterocycle systemically plicated and posterior cervix of the back pelvic cavity until the two finger breadth remain between the rectum and a plicated ligament. So this is basically thing. And the main problem of this technique is risk of urethric injury. So while taking a suture uh, through uh, uterosacrals, it's a very, very important because the ureter is very close to the uh, this uh, uretric canal is very close to the uterosacral. So you should be uh, this thing. And to eliminate this, we should do the routine cystoscopy with or without methylene glue to identify the uretric reflex following the procedure. Meckel's caldoplasty was more effective than either simple closure of the peritoneum and over three years follow-up of the preventing endocell. Uh, and the prophylactic Meckel's caldoplasty at the time of vaginal hysterectomy for vaginal prolapse is our routine practice. So this is the procedure being, I'm just showing you that after the removing of the uterus, both the uterocycles are there. So this is the, and this the, with uh, androcele, uh, to prevent the androcele, this is the posterior peritoneum. So how the sutures being taken from right side to left side from the one ureter, uh, from the uterocycles, we are placing the uh, incision like this and going through posterior peritoneum and reaching to the other side of uh, uterocycles. And just clamp it and we will obliterating the cul-de-sac and just putting only the two finger entry over there and then the closure of the vault. So this is the procedure from one uterocycle to another uterocycle and obliterating the space and finishing it off. Taking the and without cutting the much more portion of the vagina, just using the posterior suture, and this is the caldoplasty, a Meckel's caldoplasty being done. 
Now, how to do the sacrospinous fixation? The procedure was first described by the Mayaki in 1887, 1987, later popularized by the Sharp and Research and Long et al. It was originally described as a bilateral procedure, but subsequently, as of this time, we are seeing finding it out. It's very good to do in a unilateral procedure. The letter results in a less tension, though the bilateral technique is more anatomical to maintain the uh, correct vaginal wall, but single-sided, this thing has got less tension. Now, what is the technique? The technique comprises of the dissection into the paracervical space and the HTL spine is identified and using the clamps, uh, champs, ligature carrier, two non-absorbable sutures are placed through the sacrospinous ligament and one and half to the finger bread, to the medial, to the ischial spine. So the sacrospine, identify the sacrospinous ligament and the ischial spine and the suture being taken. On the end of each suture is attached to the undersurface, the posterior vaginal wall at the apical area. So when the posterior corporaphy reaches the mid portion of the vagina, sacrospinous sutures are tied, firmly attaching the vaginal apex to the surfax of the coccygeal sacrospinous ligament complex with no intervening bridge of the suture material. So you can see like this and several modifications have come, individual also, the how the innovations also, how the techniques are coming and it is coming with the each and everything and the bilateral has changed into the unilateral and that is coming up with the sacrospinous um, fixation. And it will involve different methods and how to place a suture, either the uh, uh, simple uh, this nylon or a simple suture or simple vicryl can be used. So sacrospinous injury, there's, there's got 18% recurrent prolapse between the vault aversion and cystocele. And Smear especially in 1995 wholly showed the development of asymptomatic cystocele in 92%. As more women are sacrospinous fixation, let it develop grade 2 or 3 anterior vaginal crawl prolapse also. So it is not an ideal op uh, operation for the sexually active women, but as it leads to less physiological access than sacro uh, Colpoplexy, it is associated with the exaggerated retroversion of the vagina. So it has got the advantage and it has got the disadvantage also. So although the infrequent hemorrhage and most common complication, other complications include the bladder injury also and transient and self-limiting gluteal pain could result from the injury of small nerve, which runs through the coccygeal sacrospinous ligament complex. An immediate and severe post-operative gluteal pain regarding to the posterior surface of the lag, even associated with the perineal parasthesia, indicate the posterior cutaneous pudendal sciatic nerve trauma. Then the sacrospinous fixation, symptoms like overactive bladder, stress incontinence can occur and uh, involve the anterior vagina in spite of some drawbacks. This procedure may be more suitable for the elderly where sexual function is not important. So make it a point, sacrospinous infection, for the non-sexually active female and it is good for them. And more importantly, these elder patients coexisting with the chronic medical conditions where general anesthesia is unsuitable, dangerous, sacrospinous fixation, which can be performed under regional anesthesia will be a procedure of the sign. Success rate is 70%. So this is the anatomy. So this is a sacrospinous ligament. This is the ischial spine. So we can put in the suture and do the things. So we can do the reflection of the posterior vaginal wall after hydrosection and we can find out the rectal pillars being performed and sacrospinous stitch being taken from the from a sacrospinous ligament to ischial spine and posterior vaginal wall is also been involved. The other method is iliococcygeal fixation. This is another method. This is the second method. First is a sacrospinous fixation. Another is a iliococcygeal fixation. And first described by C's and Karam in 1997, it comprises the fixation of the everted vagina apex to the iliococcygeal fascia just below the ischial spine. So usually done by the bilateral procedure, but as it imposes less tension on the vaginal wall, then sacrospinous fixation. So it should be done bilateral, but the unilateral is also very, very important. And iliococcygeal muscle can be approached through either anterior or posterior vaginal wall incision. So it is another way of putting things. It is relatively easier than the sacrospinous fixation can be done in conjunction with vaginal hysterectomy or as a separate procedure when there is a correction of wall prolapse.
a lower rate of post operative cystocele bleeding pain and suggested study comprising heliopoxial fixation to sacrospinous fixation so it's a better easier and then uh, less chances of post operative complication cystocele bleeding are both same then the heliopoxial fixation in a small series they have done in a it's based reported 11% recurrent rates and following the 14% following the heliopoxial fixation and cystocele being the commonest recurrence and it's been suggested the reduced risk of the, the pudendal nerve injury, which more into the sacrospinous fixation rather than this, and less chance of vaginal shortening. But certainly, heliococcygeal fixation offers no additional benefit over the, over the sacrospinous fixation. So number one is sacrospinous fixation, and second is heliococcygeal fixation. But it has got less complications, less problems. But anatomically, sacrospinous fixation is the First and most important, but the iliopoxygeal fixation has got the role. Then the surgical steps about it, there is the coccygeal sacrospinous, how to peel it and when to go it, then sacrospinous ligament fixation can be done. Third is more important is uterosacral suspension. This is a bilateral procedure carried out vaginally and carried out via abdominal or laparoscopic approach. It can be done by both is aimed to place the suture through the uterosacrals at the level of ischial spine with a one arm brought out through the lateral aspect of the rectovaginal fascia and through the pubocervical fascia on the east side. And this is tied anchoring the vaginal cuff to the uterus. Uh, this is uterosacrals. But the biggest risk of this uterosacral suspension, as I have already talked about, 10.9% is of injury to ureters because it's very, very close to the anterior border of the uterosacrals and especially at the level of cervix. So this is another important. And complications again include bowel injury, bladder injury, urinary tract infection, and sometimes blood. These things, there are series of people who have done the things and they are very happy with it. But most gynecologists believe that the uterosacral ligament are comprised in the first place for the prolapse to occur. And this is even preferred prefer the sacrospinous fiction, while the sum suggests that the uterosacral ligaments are not weakened and instead break up the specific point resulting into the seal and the wall prolapse. But both the schools, either the sacrospinous fixation or the uterosacral, uterosacral suspension, more, more are important and both the techniques are being used for this. Then the third, fourth technique is infracoxygeal uh, sling sacropaxy. It's a principle to create artificial uterosacral ligaments by inserting a woven nylon tapes along the anatomical, their anatomical path. And technique comprises of transverse injury in the posterior vaginal wall, 1.5 centimeter below the hysterectomy scar, and the line is opened anteroposteriorly, and entro, en, the enterocyl sac is placed backwards and allowed prolapse laterally to displace the uterosacral ligaments. Then infracoxygeal sling sacroplasty at this point Entrocyl sac is reduced by the purse string and the next step is making a bilateral incision 0.5 centimeter in the perineal skin, 4 to 8 o'clock, halfway between the cossacks and the external sphincter and having a sick conical head and a tunnel is made at the level of 3 and 9 o'clock and the handle is lifted upward 90 degrees so that the head is parallel to the floor and the shaft of the tunnel is then thrust forward to become the ischiorectal fossa. And this action penetrates the levator plate, brings the conical head of the position behind the uterosacral ligament and under the direct vision, the finger is placed between the rectum to locate the position of the rectal wall and conical tip of the tunneler is gently inclined medially towards the vaginal wall. But the most important is not being the commonly done this surgery, but this is really a better surgery uh, uh, if the thing being done properly because we are making the uterosacrals and making the, basically we want all the prolapse is well, weaken uh, uterosacral uh, ligaments. So we are making uterosacrals and this is by a woven tape and through the eye plastic insert and procedure is repeated on the both the sides. So this has got the very 5% recurrence rate and a few clinical data available about the success rate of the procedure. But the National Institute of Health and clinical excellence recommend that this procedure should only be used with a special arrangement and a governance is a research technique. So it's, it's not in a communal being done, it is under research. So we have talked already about the vaginal approach. 
all the ileosling, uh, ileo, the sacrospinous fixation, high uterosecral um, um, fixation, and all those things. Now, the abdominal approach. Abdominal approach, again, abdominal sacro uh, colpoplexy, which is done to the retroperineal interposition of uh, synthetic autologs and allograft, and between the vaginal wall and sacral promontory, was first described by the lane. Then method has proven to be superior to the other surgical techniques in terms of restoration of normal vaginal axis and maintenance of vaginal capacity. Although the short-term success rate reported for the procedure are excess of 90% and the long-term outcome remains unclear. So, but there are significant post-operative complications such as stress, urinary continence, dyspareunia, erosion, and sometimes how we use the mash and all those things. So the abdominal sacrocolpoplexy employs the interposition of the synthetic mesh tissue graft between the vagina and the sacrum. Technique allow the more global support of the vagina and previous authors have reported that the occasionally life-threatening hemorrhage is also there. Uh, in abdominal approach, the reduce the risk of operatic treatments is a modified suture placed proximately to the sacral promontory. And contrary to the previous reports, their sacral attachment does not affect the vaginal axis. So it allows the effective restoration of vaginal support while maintaining both vaginal capacity and the coital function. But the most surgeons bury the mesh under the See, the mesh is out of fashion, but I'm telling you these are the approaches people have used previously. And now I don't think the mesh is being used all over the world because there is so many problems with the mesh. But this is the approach which can be done. And these are again about the mesh, which method is best for the, this thing. There are so many controversies and uh, either the sacrospinous uh, fixation abdominal approach is good or the vaginal approach is good. So there are the descriptions and there are many, so many things are there. But a cure rate is 90%, but the mesh erosion following the use of prophylactic graph was reported so many problems with this. So while doing the abdominal procedure, the advantage over the traditional report, they say, because the normal axis of the vagina, the preservation of maximum vaginal length can be done and for the optimal sexual function. For when we talk about the vaginal approach, we are worried about the sexual function, but we will do the abdominal approach, the optimal sexual function will be there. And it also provides a source of strength in a patient and a weak tissue of the recurrent prolapse. And the reasons is quite fairly common that the operation with the 38% of the surgeon national survey carrying out for the wall prolapse. Now the laparoscopic approach, same theory is same, but they can do through laparoscopy, similar to all the anatomically, by what are doing through uh, abdominal uh, way, they are doing it with the laparoscopy, highly skilled and experience is needed, but the learning curve is very big and they have so many studies. This is one uh, wall prolapse surgery of mine which I am showing, showing the video. It's so simple. I'll make it a little faster. So just a vertical incision being given, separated the thing and this is being done, separated. So the simple uh, wall prolapse by inverted T incision being given and no infiltration, no hydro dissection, nothing being done, simply just separating um, the anterior prolapse of the vagina and prostilin and separating the bladder and repairing the things. So just it and a fixation also over there. By separating this, by giving a suture, and a sacrospinous fixation also being done in this case. So the again, there is a laparoscopic uterosacral wall suspension that can be done in a similar way. And the technique being identification of the vaginal wall apex and traction is placed in the vaginal probe. Again, laparoscopically, uterosacral ligament and wall suspension can be done. Same with abdominal procedures and everything. And the intra or extracorporeal knots can be used depending upon the surgeon's preferences. So, uh, so, another last important thing is the colpoclysis. This is a procedure which may gain popularity in the coming years as a life expectancy rises in the aging population. Colpoclysis involves a surgical obliteration of the lumen of the vagina. Different methods are described, including the post string closure or the vaginectomy or associated with the other continence procedure. Basically, 
Vaginal epithelium is mobilized anteriorly and posteriorly, leaving 2 cm from the wall, above also urethral meatus. And the prolapse is reduced by placing a progressive sutures, repeatedly uh, circumferential, and the prolapse tissue are above level of the levator plate, and it can be carried out with a partial and the total procedure. It's a very, very important and coming up thing. And a partial procedure is usually reserved for the women with intact prolapse uterus with the aim of giving access to any discharge or bleeding from the uterine opening. And it's very, very suitable for frail elderly women who is not sexually active, whom conservative methods like phase 3 is not ideal. An advantage is carried out with the under local anesthesia involves a shorter operation time, but essentially about the improving the quality of life. Now, this is the very controversial subject. I don't want to go into it. But what is the role of synthetic mesh in a wall prolapse? And we have so many studies. And uh, the mostly the role of mesh is not there. They say the success rate is 73%. But the problem with all those things are so many. There are the erosion. There are pain. There is so many things. And repeat surgeries are there. I'm just showing one video of the repeat surgery in, in previous case. For the wall prolapse, the mash is being used and then again for doing surgery is just the infiltration and being done and for the wall prolapse is surgery being done. I'll just make it a little fast forward so you can appreciate in a faster manner. So this being done, separated. Then how, how the fixation is being done and how the size because it was the erosion of the mash, the mash was being removed and the, with the use of vagina itself, this surgery being done. This is a repeat case of fall prolapse. So this androcele again, it is also being pushed and this thing being done. And a little faster again. And how fixation is being done? By separating the vaginal valve, identifying the sacrospinous ligament, and this is being done. Little bigger video, it is. So the end result will look like this in a repeat, this thing and the closure of this thing. So the conclusion is wall propolis repairs is based on the use of native tissue, synthetic material. There is no consequence on the mechanism and the management of wall prolapse, but what is expected or accepted by all the need is properly assess this patient. Involve them in the management and agree the type of surgery what they will be suitable for them for their peculiar consensus. The mesh is gaining popularity previously, but there is no studies yet to this thing. So every member matters. Thank you so much for the patient listening and giving me the chance. Thank you so much.